Hey guys, it's Goosebumps Completionist, and today I'm bringing you another episode review from the classic 90s Goosebumps television show. This episode comes from season two. It was written by Jeffrey Cohen and directed by Stephen DeMarco. And the episode in question is Ghost Beach. Now, Ghost Beach's episode was put onto the mainstream years ago by a YouTuber named John Tron. And John Tron uh, made three videos around three stories. Of course, one including Ghost Beach, one being My Harry's Adventure, and one being Don't Go to Sleep. I have yet to talk about My Harry's Adventure and Don't Go to Sleep, so this is the first of the John Tron trilogy that some fans call it, uh, that I'm going over here. But if you're not familiar with the John Tron videos, he essentially roasted the crap out of this episode, and I think his power of words and his uh, his funniness in that video has affected the opinions of this episode for many years, uh, in my opinion. I, I, I really do think that the consensus these days around this episode is quite unfair. And if you don't know what that consensus is, people think that this episode is garbage. And I don't quite think that. <laughs> you know, I've seen this episode a few times in my life. I probably saw it on Fox Family reruns back in the day. I know I saw it on Cartoon Network at least a few times. Um... And I recently rewatched it, and I also used to watch it when it was on Netflix. Uh, anytime I was just clicking on the show just to have something to watch, this one often got played. Uh, so I've seen this episode many times, and I can tell you, it, it, it gets unfair treatment. <laughs> but is it is it good? Is it genuinely recommendable? We'll see about that. And I'm I'm just gonna say up front, I'm probably not gonna stick my neck out and recommend this episode for most of you out there, but uh, unless you're like a, a big Goosebumps fan, or maybe you're a massive fan of the Ghost Beach book, or maybe you just, you know, want to check out the show exclusively or something, then of course watch it, but don't go out of your way to watch this <laughs> if you don't have to, uh, so there you go. So with that out the way, let's get into the plot overview without giving too much away. So Ghost Beach, uh, kind of like the book counterparts, begins with uh, these two siblings named Jerry and Terry. And they're out in the graveyard nearby this beach uh, that they are visiting. And they're in the in the graveyard tracing over a headstone of this deceased uh, distant relative of them uh, that they come to notice. And once this happens, they get uh, pretty much jump scared by these two uh, other teenagers in the area named Sam and Louisa. And Sam and Louisa pretty much tells them up front that <laughs> the graveyard uh, is is not a place to be and this beach is haunted by the ghost of Harrison Sadler. And uh, the kids are like, you know, stop pulling our chain. Ghosts aren't real. And, he, and they're like, no, you're going to learn pretty quickly that there is a ghost here. Uh, and you need to watch out for yourselves, essentially. Well, later that night, we get to meet um, these two caretaker cousins that are quite quite older than these kids, who are pretty much babysitting them for a month while these kids visit them and get to spend time with relatives that uh, they normally don't get to see. And the kind couple's names are Agatha and Brad. And they're, uh, you know... <laughs> Agatha makes this, uh, I guess, beef stew for dinner, and the kids are kind of repulsed by it. Uh, but the kids start to poke around about Harrison Sadler, and maybe who Harrison Sadler is, or maybe even who the kids are. And the grandparents kind of give them the runaround, give them some answers, but are being rather vague about it. But the kids seem to be mildly unfazed with it. And uh, the following day, or so it seems, they're out on the beach exploring, and we see uh, Jerry and Terry on, on the shoreline, and Jerry trips over what appears to be a dog skeleton. <laughs> and, the, and the dog skeleton freaks them out. And they're like, why is this here on the, on the shoreline? And then, of course, these two kids, Sam and Louisa, come out of nowhere again and tell them, you know what that means, right? This is, you know, the, the doing of Harrison Sadler's ghost. And the kids are like, knock it off. You know, a ghost can't really do that. And then the kids are like, you don't know what real ghosts do. Uh, and then that thought kind of plagues the, the minds of the kids again to the point where they feel like they need to get to the bottom of the situation. They realize that uh, the only way to prove <laughs> to themselves um, that possibly what they're saying is true, they're going to need to go up to this area 
uh, and investigate if there's really something there. And the kids may or may not have, have seen a light glowing within the cave to make them want to go investigate uh, further because there may be some hint of truth of what Sam and Louise are saying. So they head to the cave and of course uh, they have this interaction with this person who uh, goes by the name Harrison Sadler, of course. But Harrison assures the kids that he's not a ghost and that these two kids that uh, he's that they've met are pretty much the real ghosts. And he's like, I, I want to I prove it to you. You can go to the graveyard and find their headstones in there with their names on it. And <laughs> they pretty much are allowed to leave a free will. And the kids are like, you know what? Maybe we should go to the graveyard and look to see what was going on here. So the kids end up going to the graveyard. And while they're there, they uh, uncover pretty much some evidence here. It seems to corroborate with what Harrison was saying. And uh, not only that, uh, they also stumble across <laughs> their uh, their own graves that seem to be there. <laughs> and uh, these graves have photos on them. And, uh, and it looks like somebody's trying to, you know, plan ahead their deaths, essentially. Uh, so the kids are, of course, freaked out by this. Uh, and they're like, well, who could have done this? And then, of course, Sam and Louisa come out of the woodwork again. Um, you know, because they're the ones that actually show them the, the headstones to begin with. They're like, uh, well, it has to be Harrison Sadler. And they're like, and the kids are like, you know what? I don't know if we really believe you. We don't know who's telling the truth. But here's the thing. We're going to go up to Harrison's cave and set it straight. And the, and the uh, Sam and Louisa, they're apprehensive about it, but they follow along. They end up to Harrison's cave. Uh, and then a thunderstorm rolls around and then... The climax happens rather quickly. We find out some realizations about Harrison Sadler and Sam and Louisa and possibly who's really dead, who's really alive. We find out the fate of all the characters. And then, of course, uh, once the climax wraps up, we see an ending that implies that uh, a certain thing or, or I should say a certain animal um, has, you know, escaped <laughs> nearby and has made it to the domicile of Agatha in Brad, and we find out a major plot twist in the story and recontextualization that may or may not involve um, them wanting to eat something specific. So that, in a nutshell, is what you're going to get out of Ghost Speeches episode. So um, let, let me say this off the bat about Ghost Speeches episode. One thing that most people don't give this episode credit for is the attempt at a good atmosphere. And here's here's one thing about this episode that I will never knock against it. It still manages to have a creepy tone to it, despite a lot of ailments kind of holding back, you know, the performances or the effects. What you cannot knock is the tone of the story in the atmosphere. I think it's really good for what it is. It tries to capture the book as faithfully as possible. It's not as creepy as the book, unfortunately, because the book was able to dabble into the prowess a bit better. It was able to build tension a little bit better, even though this episode's a bit neater, and we'll get into that as another positive about it. But um, all in all, this is this is a good attempt at truncating the book from 120 pages down to 21 minutes. So uh, I, I like it for that, uh, for at least executing the tone and the atmosphere of the book to its best capabilities here. The second compliment I can give this episode is that there? this is one of those episodes that I call the Valiant Efforts. Uh, and this is kind of in the camp of Headless Ghost, almost. Uh, but as you'll see, it might fare worse than that episode for me. But they really did try to fix some ailments I had with the book here. And a lot of it has to deal with streamlining the story, making it a little more neatly, linear, less repetitive, and, uh, you know, neater in execution. And what they did here that I thought was really cool is that they cut out a lot of the back and forth in the first half of the book and they they splice scenes together like the um, exploring the beach scene that you get in the book and the discovery of the dog bones in the woods. They literally just combined it into one scene here. And then there's some consternation cleaned up from the book where <clears throat> the two kids, they end up in the graveyard and they find out some information before they first go see Harrison Sadler. Here, they don't know any information 
within the graveyard until after they visit Harrison Sadler, which points them in the right direction. And I think that does help keep the suspects a little bit more narrow and less predictable uh, in the episode. And I, I do like it for that. And I, I think that um, the pace is a bit better as well here. So, uh, yeah, th they did a valiant effort here to try to clean up some of the weaker parts of the book. And for the most part, they were able to do that. Um, I'm going to say <clears throat> what I, one of the things I really like about this episode, more so than the book, um, is the outright... <laughs> The, the outright ending of the episode, in my opinion, is a little bit more iconic to me than the book. Uh, even though a lot of people who read Ghost Beach or who have read Ghost Beach and liked it in the past said that one of their least favorite things about the book is, is the ending. Well, I think in the episode, it, it, it's a little more darker in that campy way. And it's almost borderline bad taste, but I don't think it's too far. <laughs> like some people have made the argument for. Um, I do think it's creepy and well shot. And um, Agatha and Brad's acting is great in this episode. It, it kind of elevates it when they're in scenes, in my opinion. Um, and they arguably are pretty much the only two good actors in this whole episode. Uh, and they do kind of help these scenes out when they're in it. Especially the key pivotal ones that they're involved in. Um, other than that, <laughs> let's let's rip into this episode a little bit. Because... I really feel like I have to. First and foremost, the acting here is mostly awful. This has some of the worst acting performances from pretty much the entire cast that I've seen in Goosebumps episodes. Um, Jerry is not the worst of the kids, but he has some terrible line delivery here and there. And the whole screaming stuff that he does in the episode is mildly cringe. Terry's actress cannot act. <laughs> She cannot act, and it's awful. But that is not as bad as Sam and Louisa's acting, which is by far the worst. By far the worst performances in this whole episode. And the fact the fact of the matter is, these kids could have been creepier because you eliminated the third character from the book named Nat. By getting rid of him, you could have made these. You could have at least changed up uh, the source material a little bit to make them. I don't know, a little more Stephen King-like and make them more, I don't know, just turn it up a little bit with them. But their actors cannot perform these characters well. And they become annoying and it's almost ear grating to hear them perform sometimes. Even Harrison Sadler's actor is a pretty stock character and the episode wastes them off. And in every scene he's in, they minus the, int the introduction of the character when he first meets these kids... In the back half of the back half of the episode, he's like missing, <laughs> uh, and I thought this is some wasted opportunity with this episode because they could have at least changed the book up a little bit to make him more involved and clean up some parts that the book didn't do as well, uh, and it and in turn made the climax very sloppy. And that is my second big negative with this episode: uh, the the climax is super sloppy in this thing. It's so rushed, so rushed for no reason. Besides time crunch, and uh, you can clearly tell that they had a they had a seemingly a, a neater story, but I would say about seventy five percent of it is that slow burn stuff that you get from the book, and then they're just trying to barrel through the final act because this is not getting a two parter, and uh, it clearly shows the climax is really rough. Um, the effects in this episode, the, like the special effects, even the practical effects of like dog bones and stuff. Look terrible. <laughs> the dog bones on the beach look like something that you would find at Michael's Arts and Crafts. Where they have the decorative animal bones. That's literally what this looks like. It looks cheap. And then the CGI. Good God Almighty. The CGI is terrible. Whether we're talking about the lightning bolt effects. Or the light in the cave effect. Or most infamously... The skull ghost face effect that you see on certain characters in the episode. It looks terrible. Some of the worst dated CGI from the original Goosebumps show. Um, and one last pretty decent sized negative with this wholesale. Dealing with the climax again. This is another insult to it. Going from what happened in the book 
which made more logical sense to something so ridiculous that it's almost asininely dumb to even think about uh, involving lightning striking literally the same freaking thing twice in the in the cave entrance is so dumb <laughs> and so over the top. There's an episode that it reminds me of from Mario Fred of the Dark called The Tale of the Forever Game. And I hate that stuff there involving lightning, and I hate it here. It's just super, it's super corny, if I'm being honest. Um, and yeah, um, that's pretty much like all the negatives I have, but they're pretty hard-hitting ones <laughs> against it. Um, so yeah, uh, go speech the episode. I think personally, uh, this was a downgrade from the book. And I know I have a lot I want to say when I get to the book versus episode video on this. But I really do feel disappointed with this wholesale. I, I, I don't know how the TV book's going to fare when I read it. But I have to say, uh, this is one of the biggest disappointments in the whole show. Because if there was anything that the show, I, I feel, could have gotten right um and made very good if they wanted to put some good changes into it is ghost speech and I, I don't know if it was steven demarco that you know maybe had a more flesh out idea in the script and maybe it was the the editing process that cut down the story uh i don't you know or i'm sorry it wasn't steven demarco it was jeffrey cohen my bad i don't know if jeffrey cohen's uh cohen's script was better than the uh, final product uh but i think the editing uh probably affected this in some ways and you can you can tell that a majority of the issues if it's not the acting is revolved around editing um and that and that goes to show that goes to show uh even in a low budget 90s show uh where they did have a bunch of people putting heart and soul into these episodes and trying their best to do the source material justice which you can always applaud even despite that it was the budget sometimes holding back a lot of these episodes. It's a double-edged sword, and I hate to admit it, but, um, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and this is one of those episodes that I can kind of see why people these days still want an anthology show of Goosebumps mostly or exclusively adapting old books. I mean, I get it, because if you look back at the old show... Uh, they didn't have the budget or modern technology they do now to do something like Ghost Speech. And I'm pretty sure um, with today's technology and CGI, they could probably make a creep creepier product if they really wanted to uh, compared to the 90s effects here. Um, and I totally get that. Uh, but with that out of the way, uh, what would I rate this thing from a 0 to 5 star basis? Look, the issues were medium to high hitting ones for me. Um, and, and it really does affect my enjoyment of it. But like I said early on in the video, I don't think this episode is bad. So it's not getting less than a three, but I also don't think it's good. So it's not getting a 3.5 or higher. So it's between a three to a 3.4. And a lot of you might be shocked what I'm going to say here, but I've decided to give this episode maybe like a three point. A 3.3 .3 out of 5 stars. I'm being a little nicer to this one. And the only reason why I am is because, at least in terms of writing, they at least tried here <laughs> uh, for me. And that's enough. Uh, it, it, earned a, it, earned a, it earned some brownie points for me. But um, all in all, it still doesn't make it cross that threshold to want to recommend it. You know what I mean? Uh, like It's one of those episodes that I want to like. But I just can't. <laughs> I don't really like it. Uh, but I can admire some things about it. You know what I mean? Uh, it's not good. It's not bad. It's not quite mad. It's pushing a very, very, very light okay. And I can I, I can accept that about it. So, yeah, that's my thoughts on Ghost Beach, the episode. Let me know down in the comment section if you've seen this episode before. Do you love it or do you hate it? I'm dying to know. And I'll see you next time.